first of all, I would like to say that I'm extremely honored to be able to participate in this major event. And I would like, uh, as a representative of the University of Leuven, of the ENT department of Leuven, of our research groups in audiology and speech pathology, and as the Department of Neuroscience, I, was, I would like to congratulate the Australian Hearing Hub. I think this is a major event, and putting all those very interesting, uh, important partners together will open up new avenues for even bigger things. So, uh, coming back to my talk, um, uh, I hope I won't be disappointing you from the, from the first slide already, but I'll... Of course, a lot of the things that we are doing in our research group and in, at the ENT department, research-wise, has, of course, links with speech processing, but uh, I won't be talking too much about speech processing today, but about things that we need to do to even come to better issues. But in general, um, these are a few of the items, not the items, but in fact, the approaches for my talk. So I would like to zoom into Aspects of hearing screening, language and reading. So something completely different, let's say. Um, focus on young age. So I'll show you some data from newborns to children at school. So I'll show you some data from a few months, two years, five years, and some data around 10 years. And then uh, the methods that will be uh, dealt with in, in my talk go from behavioral to objective measures. And then we'll catch uh, some ideas about neuroprocessing along the whole auditory path. So from cochlea to brainstem to cortex. And I'll use some methodologies where with the same, with the same scientific approach, by just changing stim stimulus parameters, we can sample at the different levels. And then, of course, some aspects of temporal auditory processing. So what about the topics? So it's a kind of a, a mixed salad that I'm putting here on your plate. Yeah, I know, at this time of the day, it will be a fruit salad, uh, most probably. <laughs> um, so, first of all, we'll, I'll, I'll say a few words about how to get some more information about hearing thresholds in newborns. Then uh, we'll go over, linked to that uh, screening of uh, newborns, or the follow-up of those newborns to language development, and what that early hearing screening can mean for language development. And then even later, language development after the bilateral CI. So these are two aspects that are linked to the former talks of the keynote speakers of Laurie and of Anne. And then we go to let's maybe the, the biggest chunk of this presentation that's about the population of uh, children at risk for dyslexia. Yeah? So we want to develop some neurophysiological markers where before the first formal reading instruction, we might be able to pick out those kids with some risk for dyslexia, and then to be able to train or, or whatever. So focusing on before the first formal reading instruction. Then, of course, uh, one of the issues which have become more and more important through the years, I mean, in the, in the last 10 years, a lot of 10, 15 years, depending on country to country, for instance, in, in Europe, a lot of programs have been put up for neonatal hearing screening. Of course, we, that's one point. It works rather well in a number of countries, most of the countries in Europe at least. Um, and then, of course, adult hearing screening, we know how to do it. The problem is how to proliferate and how to get to those people. But now the next issues that pop up is, of course, what do we do with children that go to school, primary school or just before primary school? So <laughs> there, this, the, this topic will deal with that uh, or touch upon those issues. And then a general thing is, if you want to know more things about children, we have to really develop and invest in development of new test methodologies. And I'll give you a grasp of what we are, one of the paths that we are following to learn more about that. Okay, so first item is the, uh, how to get information about thresholds in neonates. I'll just give you an overview of how we are working with. I'm quite, no, I, I know very well that in different countries, different approaches are being used. This is how we work at the moment. At the moment, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. So, in our country, we have a general neonatal hearing screening since 1998. So r immediately, we we got a lot of problems. Where, uh, of course, immediately people came at that moment with uh, 
if you have a child at the age of uh, a few months and you know you have already a diagnosis, I mean, people were not used to deal with that in rehab because uh, b the test that was used before was based on the Ewing test. So that means it was only at the earliest in time, it was about eight, nine, ten months that those children were, were coming. So this opened up a complete new field. And one of the, the major questions that we got from the clinical field was that there is really need to get some frequency specific information for diagnosis and treatment of the hearing loss. And so we did a lot of investment uh, on auditory steady state responses to try to use the technique to apply in those very young children. Um, of course, focusing at brainstem level where you can obtain responses while the kids are sleeping. Uh, in adults, it was known already that rather high correlations, there is a lot of variability, but on the other hand, very high correlations between the, the, the hearing thresholds, the behavioral thresholds that can be obtained with those, those ASSR thresholds. So this was a very nice starting point to continue. Okay, so ASSRs, yeah, just a few words for uh, v very generally. Um, you need modulated signals, so modulated signals that give rise to a modulated response. And the major thing is that with these um, responses, they can be analyzed in the frequency domain. That means that we can really work with frequency-specific stimuli to get a frequency-specific response. It's a kind of temporal integration response, so it's different from onset or transient responses that we use in normal ABR or, so, or other uh, um, evoked potential work. Um, the interesting thing is that, and this will come back in, in uh, different parts of my talk, is that by changing that rate of that modulation of the signal, we are able to sample at different stages of the auditory path. That means, um, if I jump to my next slide, um, all frequencies down to, let's say, 80 hertz, 70, 80 hertz, the generators of those responses, ASSR responses, are mainly brainstem level. So if you go down with the modulation frequency, you gradually shift to, towards the cortex. And so if you're close to, let's say, uh, in between 2 and 20 hertz, then we're really at cortical level. So depending on the modulation frequencies, and of course, the, the methodologies to analyze those data, and, and, and so um, we are able to sample different levels, stages of, of the auditory path. So what are the performance measures that we're following? Of course, the response, so where's my mark here? Response amplitude, signal to noise ratio, amplitude growth functions, phase and latency. Latency is very important because based on the latency, you also know at what stage in that path that you are. And then, of course, and this becomes more and more important in neuroscience, uh, you can look to coherence aspects. So you can combine information. You can see it's completely different from the structural information that we get from a lot of the imaging um, uh, data, is that you can relate some um, activity at some part in the brain with activity that happens at another part of the brain. So you can go with these measures, also study um, coherence aspects, so connectivity between different structures. Uh, okay. So, um, application towards the uh, newborns is that we can work, for instance, this is an, an example, uh, that you can, for instance, stimulate two ears at the same time, measure two ears at the same time. You have four um, carrier waves, carrier frequencies, let's say 500 hertz, 1,000, 2,000, 4,000 in both ears, but you just have to make sure that they are modulated at different modulation frequencies. So that means that you give a, a complex stimulus, which is sampling at the same time four different parts on the left and on the right cochlea. And then it shows up in, in the EEG signal as you have a huge uh, noise bump, of course, the EEG noise, but it should show up as distinct peaks in your uh, uh, spectrum of your uh, EEG. And those particular peaks, so these peaks are, each of these peaks is related to one of these carrier waves. So by learning something of these amplitudes and loudness growth, we can get some information about the specific uh, responses at these carrier waves, so 500 to, to uh, 4,000. This is just a choice. You can take uh, whatever free carrier wave frequency, of course. Okay. Um, 
This has been a, a method that has been known already for a long time. It was uh, introduced by Galambos and further worked out by uh, Terry Picton. And it has been applied in children o only about uh, six, seven years ago, I, I, I would say, uh, for clinical applications. Um, of course, the responses, if you go from brainstem to cortex, they are dependent on those modulation frequencies. Okay, I'll show you some data. How, so if you stimulate at different intensities, for instance, 0 dB SPL, you see no responses, and then you, you crank up your uh, intensity of your stimulus, and you gradually see for this uh, subject, at some point you see those eight peaks uh, appearing above the, ro the noisy background. So it's in fact, if a, a, a peak is present, that gives you an idea, and based on uh, these measurements, as a function of the intensity of the stimulus, you can get some idea about where thresholds might be uh, uh, lying. Okay, to give you an idea, at 55 dB SPL, five minutes measurement, this is a kind of peaks that you can get, and so you can get an infor some information. So coming back to uh, uh, results obtained in adults, and then we'll go to newborns. So we, in adults, for different frequencies, we can go up to very high correlations. Of course, you see there is some scatter. This is one of the issues in ASSR. So you have, but you have a mean difference where you can correct for, and then the variation, 10 dB, which is still feasible if you use. So this is an experimental setup that's being used for ASSR, a setup that has been made specifically for optimizing ASSR. It's different from the clinical devices that are on the market to measure ASSRs because they do not allow all the flexibility to do these measurements. Okay, so in neonates, the amplitudes are a lot smaller. This is what you can see, oops. In neonates, the amplitudes are a lot smaller than in adults, but it's still feasible to, to uh, get to the results. So, in children, so here I'm presenting some data of all children that have been tested within the first three months after birth. So, um, and on the horizontal scale, so this is for four different frequencies. I was losing my mind. 500,000, 2,000, 4,000. We have reasonable correlations. And then, um, of course, there is some scatter. On the horizontal scale, we have the thresholds obtained using the objective technique, ASSR. On the vertical scale, the behavioral threshold. Yeah, in these young kids, yeah, but of course, later. So these behavioral thresholds that are used for putting up this slide, for these figures have been obtained at the earliest possible date. But on average, that means that those behavioral uh, thresholds have been obtained, the median is 17 months later. 17 months, yeah? So, and then of course, yeah, you see there is a mean difference. You can correct for the mean difference, and of course, the variation. I agree, the variation is there. But it's still feasible, let's say. Okay, and as well, you can measure latencies to give you uh, one idea. Uh, here's some data that I show, even uh, at these young ages. I'm talking here about neonates uh, between, I always lose one, okay. So one week, two, three weeks, and more than three weeks. So that was four or five weeks. You can clearly see that the latency, so this is a kind of mat maturation effect that's happening in each, at each of these frequencies. So it really gives you an instrument um, to get more information that can be used clinically. So how is our procedure in, in Flanders? Um, all the kids that are being, uh, that get a refer, almost half of them has been referred to the Leuven uh, University Hospitals. And this technique is in all of them. Next to the ABR that's always been done, is also being applied, just to give more information for diagnosis. Okay. Um, so I'll just give you one short case study. This is about a baby, four weeks, mild hearing loss was expected. This is the result that got out of it. So some information about the subject. So 25 days old. Uh, yeah, this is, it was a very young kid. Uh, at the screening, which is based on the automatic ABR, the left ear got a refer, the right ear a pass. And uh, so then the appointment ENT department, so that was three days after the screening. We are obliged to find moments within the 14 days after detection screening of the kit that gets a refer. Within 14 days, the kit has to be uh, followed up in one of the, the uh, refer centers. 
So uh, then the whole battery is being uh, applied, of course. The transient evoked autocus uh, um, emissions were absent in both ears. Um, and then, of course, the ASSR recordings were, were recorded in natural sleep. And this is the result. Uh, you see at 40 dB SPL, no responses. 50 dB SPL, three were significant, th three significant responses. At 60 dB SPL, all eight. So that means we got to a mild hearing loss. These were the data. And if we then compare, we put it on uh, a kind of an audiogram. So I'll try to walk you through because there are a lot of data on, in this. So here you see the average of a normal, popul normal hearing infants of this age, so of the first three, four months. And with the standard uh, um, deviation mentioned. What we have measured now here are these values for this baby. Yeah, or these four values. It was in the BSPL, here it's corrected for DBHL, of course. Yeah. So uh, these are these data. Yeah. And then, of course, if we correct for the difference scores, because we know there is a kind of an offset, then you see that this should be the, the data that we have to deal with. To comp this is, should be close to thresholds. So then the nice thing is, in this case, of course, a very conservative approach is being followed, uh, regular follow-up appointments, and then the first visual reinforce reinforcement audiometry in this kit was done at 14 months, and these are the red data, and you see that those red data, 14 months later, they agree rather well with what we have obtained with the ASSR data, yeah? which were obtained just a few weeks after. Uh... Okay, so, um, there is, of course, so middle mild hearing losses are often not diagnosed. So here is a technique where we can do something for follow-up. And then, of course, uh, there is always the issue about the variability in those data. But if you measure at different frequencies, then, of course, you can make fits of your thresholds. And then the importance of that vari variability in one frequency is less important. But the same is true also for behavioral observation in those young kids. So. Okay, so this is a nice uh, point to, to go to the next uh, item that I shortly would like to discuss with you. That's about language development of those early hearing screened children. So um, I'll show you some data of a retrospective study. So it's about N equals 288, so which is for that, uh, for these kind of studies is, is, is a big study. So it's a multi-center study where data have been obtained. And of those 288, 149, of those children, they have got, they were in the system when, since the, the newborn screening, the new newborn screening was in place. And the other 139 were the late screened ones that was with the former, the Ewing based screening. Yeah. So um, there were, of course, a lot more subjects with uh, cochlear implants, but we singled out these 288 because, of course, we want to stick to very strict inclusion criteria. And all those kids had their cochlear implant before the f uh, five years of age. Um, the test that I will be showing data from for language comprehension was the Renel developmental language, language scales. For language production, it was the Schlichting expressive language test. In fact, only two of the three tests. So the, the, the one that goes uh, focuses on word and the one that focuses on sentences. And the data that I will be showing you are, in fact, language quotient, quotients. So it's, in fact, the ratio of the score of the child relative to the expected score. And so one is, in fact, the reference. I'll show you data about the age at diagnosis, age at CI, and then the language data obtained at different uh, moments in time, one year after the, um, the CI, two years, and three years. And for those 288 uh, kids, of course, age at diagnosis, yeah, this is, in fact, trivial. If you have an earlier screening, of course, chances are bigger that you have an earlier diagnosis. So this is a bit trivial, looking for my pointers. These are the early screens. You see here, it's within a few months that you have some diagnosis as the median. Um, and for the late screen, it's a lot later, so uh, uh, later than one year that there is a diagnosis. This seems normal, okay. Age at cover implantation, of course, that's also related. The early screen, they were a little bit later than one year. And then the late screen, you see that was in between two and three years. Okay, but then the really interesting data is in fact about the language development comparisons. 
And then you see on these three different uh, tests, it was all similar, gave the same results. I'll show here only one, that's for the RNL uh, data. You see here, one is the reference. That means this is for, for the normal, normally developing uh, children. And then one standard, one standard deviation, two standard deviation. And you see for the late screen children, the median, of course, there is always a huge variability, of course, yeah. But the median is outside the two standard deviations, but you see, for the early screened children, you see that they come within two standard deviations. And this difference is, for all of these three tests, statistically significant. So this is a nice result. Okay, going even, even, even further, going to bilateral uh, cochlear implants from the same set, because a number of those kids have, been, have got a second cochlear implant. You should know that, uh, of course, a lot of data have been obtained in the last 10 years about bilateral CI in children, mostly focusing on auditory aspects and speech-related aspects. On language-related aspects, there are only few data available. So this is one of the data sets that are available now uh, for zooming into the language aspects of those kids. So um, the same uh, 288 data, but all, there were 25 kids who had two cochlear implants. And those 25 were all taken. But from the other kids with only one cochlear implant, we tried to find another a best match. So they are matched with uh, 25 other children with one cochlear implant based on 10 different dimensions, auditory, child, and env environmental factors. And again, we looked at those three. Uh, I mean, these are the same data, but in fact, at three years. So if you zoom into those data, then the major result is, so here you see the three language. So this is the, the Schlichting test based on uh, focusing on sentences, Schlichting test on word development. And this is the RNL scales, yeah, comprehension and expressive language. And then these are always, so again, here you have standard scores. So 100 is what we uh, have for the normally developing uh, children. Then again, indicated in these figures is one standard deviation and two standard deviations. And with the unilateral CIs, you see that these are the scores, so close to two standard deviations. But even with bilateral CIs, and this was a, an aspect that was not really um, addressed so much in, the, in, in the, the last years. I mean, you need data to do this kind of, of work, of course. A lot of data before you can single out these things. And then you clearly see significant differences from bilateral CI relative to one CI. Okay, so I come over to my next uh, point that's about zooming into dyslexia. So we've had screening, some things about screening in neonates. We went, we used that uh, information as a basis towards going to language development issues in, in children with cochlear implants. And now we'll go over to reading in children. And the major uh, point that we would like to address is in fact find some neurological markers or behavioral markers, but that's, then you need methodologies, other methodologies. Markers that give us an idea about the state of the, the children that are at risk for dyslexia before the first reading instruction. I'm talking about four to five years, let's say. So we zoomed in last year of kindergarten. That was the age that we were zooming in. Okay. So, first a few words about dyslexia. So it's, uh, as most of you know, even better than me most probably, neurological learning disorder which manifests through severe, that's one, but also persistent reading and spelling problem. It's not enough that, that uh, it, the, the problem, the reading problems have been detected at some point. The reading problems have been detected at some point, but then you, know, you need to, to do some remedial efforts and it's only after two more years that you can actually say that this is, we're dealing with dyslexia or not. So it's severe and persistent reading and spelling problems. And there is a prevalence, it depends a bit from uh, uh, study to study and from uh, language to language also. But these are, an, this is an overall figure coming from a, um, a, a multi, uh, multi paper, multi article analysis. So prevalence between 5 and 10%. And of course, what is 
very clear in all those studies is that it's really linked to a phonological deficit. So how do we make words, syllables, and phonemes? What is a phoneme, the different phonemes, and how to address them? So this is something that's really clear. The problem is, what is the cause of that phonological deficit? And then there are different theories. And, and there are a lot of people in the world working on that, and we are focusing a little bit on the temporal, as temporal theory aspect. So again, different theories. We are just focusing on one of those hypotheses that the temporal processing in the neural system might have something to do with it. That's our hypothesis, and that's what we want to study. So the reading in this graph, you see the reading and spelling problems. This error is really clear. It's based on a phonological deficit. But then, what is a, how a phonological deficit can be, can be caused? This is where we are studying, trying. In this hypothesis, this is what we want to know. And what we have detected is that there are some clear indications that there are some auditory temporal deficits. Small, but they are present. And then what is in between is, of course, then the speech perception deficit. Um, this is the, this path that we are, uh, this is the path that we are focusing on. But it might as well be part of an overall temporal processing deficit. So not only in the auditory path, but in, in the somatosensory as well as in the visual path. So at this moment we're also studying the visual path. We have found some tests where we can, for instance, coherent motion, where we also see a significant difference between dyslectic adults, dyslectic children, and their uh, normal reading uh, counterparts. But okay, I won't be uh, focusing on these aspects. I will be focusing on that, the, the auditory temporal uh, path pathway. So what are the, the methodologies, the tests that we can use to get information at these different stages? So I'll just name a few. The, the ones that we have been applying first in adults, and now I'll be showing you some data, what we are applying in a longitudinal study in children of about five years. So um, radiological approaches, so the diffusion tensor imaging uh, data, resting state, and then, of course, also the ASSR in EEG. So we have data about all of them. I'll be uh, showing you some data about the ASSR uh, aspects. Um, to tell you, we have been able to measure these in five-year-old children, but with a lot of effort. Um, then, to get a grasp on the auditory temporal deficit, so it's the, uh, we did a lot of tests, but in fact it's the FM detection test that always comes back, rise time detection test, and as a control we use intensity discrimination, just to know that it's to know is it a problem with the procedures or the psychophysical approach, or is it a problem really with, with FM or rise time? And what we have seen in adults and in children is that they fall out on FM and rise time, but not on intensity discrimination. So at least you know that the psychophysical procedures are not a problem there. Um, speech perception, sentences in noise, words in noise, and categorical perception. So these again, so these two I will deal in the remainder of uh, my talk here. And then phonological, so there we use uh, very, uh, I mean, uh, uh, precise instruments that are used in the social sciences to get a grasp on the phonological deficit, phonological awareness, verbal short time memory, rapid automatic naming. And then, of course, so these are the things that are going on. So I'll be zooming in to show you some data on categorical perception, so psychophysically uh, obtained. First, adults, then I'll show you data obtained in children. And then uh, ASSR data, electrophysiological, where we directly start with showing some data in uh, children at uh, five years old, but then we'll I'll compare with some adult data that have been obtained. So in, in um, the categor categorical perception experiments, the main uh, research question that we posed there was, is it really a, a problem or a deficit that's related to the speech or the non-speech aspects of the, the signals, the stimuli? Or is it about the temporal or the non-temporal aspects? So we made the factorial design, two times two. We made stimuli, I'll show you right away, where we can address those issues. And then in the ASA, that we can say later then. Okay, so um, in the categorical perception experiment, we used stimuli, this is one of the four stimuli, a bada continuum, so where you have 10 stops. So you go from ba to da, 
you, we know that only the second formant is changing in those uh, stimuli, and you go in 10 intermediate steps. And what you want to know is where actually happens that transition in a normal reading uh, uh, population compared to a dyslexic, dyslexic reading or high risk for dyslexia. In this case, all dyslexic readings. So it's a kind of an ABE, we use an ABX paradigm, so ba, da, and then one of those steps, and then it has to be addressed in a two, two forced uh, alternatives. It's either a ba or a da. Okay, so I'll show you some data that have been obtained in uh, a study comparing 31 dyslexics and 31 normal readers. And then in children of 11 years, because of the psychophysical procedure is so complex that it's in fact uh, this is not feasible at five year olds if you do not need if, if you do not use additional methodologies i'll come back to that later so and here 11 dyslexics were compared to 25 normal readers uh, and of course matching matching is always you have to match as much as possible this is one of the 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 problems in this kind of research i mean if you do not match well enough then you Matching is important. So this is the two times two uh, co um, factorial design. So with stimuli, so these are, we start with the uh, with BADA, the BADA. So it's only the second formant. So this is the time on the horizontal axis and the frequency on the other axis. Only the formants are, uh, of these speech sounds are being uh, um, represented. And the green one is the only formant that's changing. Yeah. So, um, and these were synthetic stimuli, so we could clearly control only that format and not the rest. And so we have 10 steps in between these two. So this fills the box, let's say, between temporal, because there is something changing. In fact, it's more spectrotemporal. It's not only temporal, it's also sp uh, spectral, of course. Uh, but the main difference with the other stimuli is, in fact, the temporal aspects, and it's speech-like, temporal speech. And so we go further. If we fill up this box, it was with an OU continuum. So this is clearly non-temporal. Format is changing, non-temporal, only spectral. And the other box is uh, for the non-speech stimuli. We took the same stimuli as for the speech, but we rotated them, rotated around two uh, kilohertz. So this is a technique that has been used already for 20, 30 years to go from speech to non-speech stimuli, but to be able to control. <coughs> And again, temporal, non-temporal. Yeah, if you really want to hear, I can hear. So this is a rotated U or U or, or U. So if you recognize it, this is rotated. Terrible, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, so coming back to some data. So these are the, the, the fitted curves. These are group data. So this is impossible to obtain at, at individual level. These are group data. Um, the red curves are for the normal readers in adults, normal readers, and the, the other curves are for dyslexic readers. And what clearly comes out is that in the non-temporal, there is no significant difference. In the temporal ones, it's a significant difference in both. So you see dyslexics have a more a problem in making that boundary between going over from one side of a stimulus to the other side of the stimulus. So this was clearly significant. And non-significant difference in the non-temporal part. Okay, then in those children, again, I'll show you here, so it's again, speech, non-speech, temporal, non-temporal. These are the fitted curves, group data again. And you see the dyslexics compared to the, to the normal readers. And again, no differences here, and here a difference. It was slightly significant but it was significant. So here again, children also have a problem with it, and not here. So here in this graph, all those data have been put together. So these are the, these are the four stimuli that have been used. And um, yeah, you can clearly see that, so the, the, dark, the dark bars are here for the adults. You clearly see that the adults are always scoring better than the children. Oh yeah, let me say, these are the data, excuse me, for the slopes of those curves. So the slopes in the 50% point, or in the median, the slopes. To give you an idea about the difference, how the, the boundaries are being uh, categorized. 
So the children are always doing uh, not, not as good as the, as the, the adults. That's one uh, conclusion. But the other conclusion is the one that I addressed already, that as well as for adults as for children, it's only in the temporal aspects that there is a difference. There is no difference, dyslexics or uh, normal readers, in the non-temporal, in the speech or non-speech differences. So this is evidence for an auditory temporal processing deficit and not purely cognitive linguistic. That was our result. OK, this was about the categorical perception data. Um, then I go over to the ASSR data, so the electrophysiological data. What are the research questions there? So a big issue is the rates. So we're going to sample now at an, not at brainstem level, we're going to cortical level. That means we are going to use ASSR stimuli with modulation frequencies that are a lot lower. That means in the area between 2 and 50 hertz. We picked out 4 and 20 hertz. Why? because 4 hertz is very close to the, to the syllab syllable rate in running this course. The 20 hertz is very close, it's between 15, it depends on, on, sp on speech rate, of course. The 20 is very close to the phoneme rate. But in, in neuroscience in the last, uh, let's say, 5 to 10 years, there is a huge debate about, you know, it's not a deb yeah, it's, it's a debate, about uh, oscillations in the brain, where are they happening, and about the hemispheric laterality. I mean, if we go back 15, 15 or more years, everybody thought that, and that was the, at that moment, uh, the impression, if you stimulate the right ear, then it's the left hemisphere where all the processing is going on. If you stimulate the left ear, it's the other side. So it has been completely reversed, some of those issues, and this is where we tap into. So we try to see if between the dyslexic population and a normal reading population that we find those differences between syllable rate processing in the brain and phoneme rate processing in the brain. Because in reading, in normal reading uh, uh, evolution, we see that children at the youngest age when they start reading, they are more focusing to syllables. And then you go on, adults, we do everything phoneme based almost. I mean, the language in the interpreter is, the, is, is going on with, in fact, almost grapheme representation as phoneme representation and some words that are new. Okay, um, so the main question is, do syllable and phoneme rate brain processing differ between children and adults? That's, the, that's uh, a main issue. And also between preschoolers and high and low risk, at high and low risk for dyslexia. Again, working towards a physiological, electrophysiological marker to be able, before first formal reading instruction, to be able to say, we would like to do it at individual level. These are, again, group level data. OK. So, um, yeah. What is uh, the ASSR stimuli are really coming extremely close to a very good model for speech, at least for the speech envelope. We know that the speech envelope is extremely important for speech understanding. Uh, in cochlear implants, have mainly the speech envelope of course, across different channels, but you do not need too many spectral channels to be able to understand speech. So the SSR give, you, give us a perfect model for sampling what's happening with speech envelope processing. So if you go further, so there is a syllable rating. So if you look to all those frequencies apparent in the envelope of running speech, then you see that going from a few hertz to uh, 30, 40 hertz. And so you have there the syllable rate, you have the phoneme rate, and the stimuli that we will be using are a model for that. So I'll show you here. So this is a, the SSR stimuli that we have been using. So this is a speech-weighted noise. That means that we take the same spectrum as the average speech. So it's close to speech, let's say, at least spectrally. And we, and we emphasize the modulations, choice of 4 hertz or 20 hertz, focusing on the syllable rate or the phoneme rate processing in the brain. And so this sounds like, most of you will know, but that's the four hertz. And this is the 20 hertz. OK. So um, yeah, this is a, a, a waveform, speech waveform. And then, uh, of course, you can 
filter it in, for instance, four different uh, filter bands and analyze the modulations in that filter band and then you, each time you come with such a, a frequency, such a uh, spectral representation, a transfer function, and then you see for the different frequencies it's always in between, let's say, 2 hertz and let's say 30, 40 hertz, so here you see 20, that uh, those are the frequencies apparent in that envelope. And uh, there is a remarkable correspondence between these time scales for phon phonemes, sil sil syllables, and phrases in linguistic units, and on the other hand, the periods of the gamma, beta, theta, and delta oscillations in the brain. So they are certainly linked in, in, some, in some part. And there is a lot of literature in neuroscience about that in of the last uh, one or two years, really linking and even um, supporting this um, idea that those ASSRs might be ideal stimuli to, to capture information about this processing in the brain. Okay, this is these are some data on speech uh, under understanding where has been shown by Bob Shannon from Hauser Institute, uh, House Institute by now, I guess, um, uh, showing that only on the envelope and a little bit of spectral information is enough to understand, uh, go up to very high levels of understanding, speech understanding. I'll come to the data. Okay, so this is what I'll be presenting you is uh, our data, ASSR data of 75 preschool children in the last year of nursery school. And this is part of a longitudinal st study. So those kids have been selected. It took a long time to select them. They have been trying to do a very good matching with a child of the same cl uh, class where they're in. And so we'll be following them through age until that uh, they have a clear, um, how should I say, diagnosis of dyslexia or not. So they have been selected as, so we have 34 high-risk children and 41 low-risk. So we start with the high risks, of course, because that's based on dad and mom being dyslexic or not. So there is a whole procedure and family and, and whatever. But just to, to say that it's, this, is a, uh, this is about one to one and a half year work to single out uh, those 34 high-risk kids coming from all over the place, all over the place in little Belgium. Um, and of course, matching according to age, gender, nonverbal IQ, and particularly parental educational level. Not only the mother level, but also the, 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 the education level of the dad. Um, stimulus speech varied noise at those different modulation frequencies. It was a right ear stimulation, and we used the setup with 64 electrodes, and the data that we'll be showing are just based on 10 minutes per condition. And here I'll zoom into only response measures, signal to noise ratio and the laterality index to get an idea about in what hemisphere do we have that uh, processing. Okay, auditory steady state stimuli. Here again, this is the speech shaped noise and then we have the modulation and then we are gonna look for these kind of peaks in the EEG signal and we need artifact rejection and, and so the whole battery of signal processing here again is being used to be able to single out the four hertz and 20 hertz because the 80 hertz, uh, <coughs> Yeah, this I, I can say. Uh, the 80 hertz is mostly being detected in a, in a sp spectral domain where the noise is a lot, lot lower. And so 4 hertz and 20 hertz are really on top or in the flank of, of this, in the slope of the noise uh, background. So it needs some uh, signal processing to be able to, uh, to uh, use them. Yeah, this is just some snapshots, some photos of uh, how those are being done, the data. So, these are very recent data um, obtained by, uh, within the PhD uh, of uh, Sophie van Voren in, uh, in our lab. So these are data for 4 hertz, 20 hertz, 80 hertz was taken also. 80 hertz is clearly brain stem. This was taken here as a control situation. And you immediately, immediately see a huge significant uh, difference between left hemisphere and right hemisphere. Of course, we're stimulating right so it's, this is normal, so it, it comes out. Uh, four hertz, clearly, rightly, all significantly, uh, very significant, it, it's coded right. So right stimulation and four hertz is completely right. And we didn't see a difference yet um, between dyslexics, no, I shouldn't say that, between low risk and high risk children. You have to, to know here at this moment, these children, we do not know which of those kids will be dyslexic or not. 
we just know that in the whole bunch there are a number of them higher than if you would have a normal population, 5 to 10 percent. So what our estimates based on another longitudinal study is that we will have between about 35 percent of the kids might turn out to be dyslexic. So, but we don't, do not know yet. So they are in the, the average of a number of measures will be higher, but within the, in the next phase, after the next phase, then we will know and we will have to reanalyze these data to see if we find the significant differences. So here we see already hemispheric uh, laterality issues, not at 20 hertz. And then this is the lateral, lateralization data. We clearly see that for the, the low risk as well as the high risk, the 4 hertz, 4 hertz is clearly right. 80 hertz clearly right, but that's brainstem, that's normal. And uh, 20 hertz, 20 hertz is uh, in the high risk kids, is, seems to be more left. It's really on the edge of uh, significance. Um, if we compare to the normal reading adults, then we see that everything fits children with adults um, for 4 hertz and for 80 hertz, fits rather well. But there is a transition, seems to be a transition for the at 20 hertz. So it might be that children that might be dyslexic, so they are maybe tearing this, uh, this point down, that they start with a more left organization and going to right in adult. But these are things that have to be further followed up, of course. So another interesting thing is that we, we see already relations with phonology. Even if this, this whole group of low risk and high risk together, I say there is a higher proportion maybe of kids that might be uh, turn out to, to be dyslexic. Even then we see already a correlation that's significant between those electrophysiological markers with the phonological awareness. Even there, although it's not significant, uh, it is significant uh, uh, different, but we see already a correlation. So we are quite sure that if we follow up these data, that it might be that, this, that, that we will see clear differences between low risk and high risk for the phonological awareness. Okay, so what are the results? Syllable rate cortical responses are lateralized to the right. Laterality of phoneme rate brain oscillations are different between preschoolers and adults. And there are already relations of these as data with cognitive and psychophysical data. Um, again, I would like to stress that at this moment, we do not have a clear distinction yet between dyslexic or yes or no. So we will have to reanalyze after these data after that we know how uh, those kids have, have been evolving. Uh, I also would like to say that this seems, might seem uh, not, not so clear at all, but in adults we have, we have really seen clear relations between ASSR and other measures. I'll just pop up, I do not show data here about, but in the data of um, Hannah Poolmans, we have shown that in fact the, there was a relation between the 20 hertz and the speech in noise understanding scores, uh, wait, what did I say, uh, 20 hertz and the phoneme rate scores. <coughs> So word scores, where you score phonemes, and not on sentence level. And with the four hertz, that was correlated with the sentence level, sentences that we used. So, and that was significant. So that's reported in these, these papers. Okay, of course, these are just a few measures. The, I mean, there are a lot of things to do. These are just all based on electrode information. So we have to transform to sources. And then, of course, the, those laterality indices will become higher <coughs> sources. Connectivity measures, the relation with the DTI and the resting state, everything is available, everything is measured a few months ago. And relation with psychophysics, FM detection, rise time detection, speech and noise. So this is just a minor part of all those data sets. Okay, and uh, to show you, this is not with those kids, but we think that we might be coming close to them, to these data. So this is toward source localization and laterality. Just one slide that I want to, to show you that uh, using the Beza Clara uh, implementation with the four shell head metal, we have been talking about that, Philip, uh, yesterday. <coughs> and this is for the 40 hertz ASSR. This is always the first that we check because just the responses are highest of all those ASSRs. Um, and we can clearly make, on subject level, we can do. So this is subject per subject with this approach. But you need a good head model. But then you say, how are you gonna do that in those kids? But in those five-year-old kids, we have the structural information because for the DTI we have the structural information. 
So I'm quite confident that we will be able to do this uh, in those children too, and even on subject level. Anyway, I still have a few minutes, I guess. Uh, I'll come to my next point, hearing screening of children at primary school. Um, I'll walk through it a little bit uh, uh, quicker than I had pretended. Um, I'll show you some data about the methodology that is used, but has only been checked now in an adult population. But it should be transferable to what can be done in, in, in children. In, in, we have been looking to occupational noise effects and hearing screening in, uh, and based on an internet-based uh, system, but they can do their tests themselves. And I'll show you some sensitivity and specificity of the, that approach. And so I don't see any reason why it should not be possible. And I'll show you some pilot study showing the feasibility in children at some age, but not yet at five years old. Okay, so what is the, here we go for speech and noise tests for hearing screening. Um, because it's particularly, it has been shown that it's particularly sensitive to supra threshold hearing problems. Those are the ones that we want to, not only the audibility, but we're interested in those supra threshold problems. It's a supra threshold measure, something different. So that means that we are less dependent on the background level. You do not need a double walled uh, uh, room to do these kind of measurements. Because your noise, you apply your noise at 65 or 70 dB SPL, and then you're checking relative to that level. So it's a re relative level signal to noise ratio. That means that your absolute calibration is also less of an issue. Of course, not if you are 20 dBs uh, wrong, but a few dBs doesn't make a difference. It's not a problem. As, as far as the, your speech and your noise in the same channel is uh, relatively uh, OK, and that should be done. It's easy because it can be administered via internet, via PC or tablet, with a headphone or earphones. That has been done already in the data I'll be showing. It's re realistic because it's based on speech, and speech is relevant for everyday communication. And yeah, this is an argument that we can, it's very hard to, to prove, but uh, it might be that, that people are more motivated to do that kind of testing. It's not sensitive to mild conductive hearing losses, too. That's because of the relative uh, values there, and th that we test at a high level. So what we use here is the data I will be showing is uh, based on digit triplet tests. So these are triplets, so five, six, eight, and you have to identify them. So you can use the simple keyboard of a PC or whatever. It's an automatic self-test. It takes about three to four minutes per year. It's, and it's almost not dependent on language and cognitive level. That has been shown in very recent studies, also uh, done at, in Amsterdam. In Oldenburg, they're also doing some studies on, on that. Uh, and it's clearly different from sentence level. Sentence level is, as we know, it's very language and cognitive, can be language and cognitive level, dependent. depends on what tokens that you're using. It's an adaptive testing, so it goes very fast. OK, so these were just te tests in an occupational hearing loss uh, population. Uh, correlation with the uh, tone audiogram, so the, the average of 2, 3, 4, and 6 kilohertz. And um, yeah, you see a nice correlation. And then we go to, I'll show you right away, some sensitivity and specificity values. So if you have your uh, criterion at 10 dB HL, you come to sensitivity and specificity values around 90%. That's not bad at all. If you put it at 50 dB HL, for instance, if you really want to pick out, yeah, thank you. If you really want to pick out those uh, um, hearing losses above 50 dB HL, you go even higher. So you, are, you have sensitivity and specificity between 90 and 100%. So this seems, from a starting point, an ideal test. So methodology, certainly applicable in, in children. Um, so we tried it out, screening for hearing loss, about 100 kids and 114 of first secondary and in the fifth primary, so that's about 10 years. Did your triplet test, and so we did about the same. This was mainly, mainly focusing on feasibility of the test. So the whole test, two hours, the kids can almost do it in the, completely independently. It took about between six and seven minutes. Intrasubject reliability via the PC, via the internet is 0 0.66 dB, so that's that's very very good. Uh, and we found that for those ears that are being picked out that got a fail. All the fails had at least one, mostly several frequencies, um, with the hearing loss above 30 dBHL. So what we have seen is that the SRT criterion changes with age. So it means 
it's a bit hard to, with this, these low numbers of impaired here, impaired, it's not an event, it's very slight uh, going above 30 dBHL. The numbers are too small yet to go to sensitivity and specificity values. But there is no way why it should be different, I guess, than what we have obtained in the adults. But we have to take into account that the uh, criterion for the SRT, where we have the, the seizure between uh, what's a green light, what is a red light, or an orange light, whatever, that is different from age to age. So this is based on uh, SRTs of those 212 normal years that have been tested. And then you see that for, this is for the adults, so minus 9.5 would be a perfect criterion. But you see it has to be changed a little bit to minus 8 and minus 8.5 for children. So, technology, so what, is the result of, what is the result of this? That technology-wise feasible can be done, would be a very nice instrument, but we have to adapt the, the criteria where the SRT, SRT breaks off. Okay, so I come to, quickly to my last uh, point that's about new methods to test young children. So preschoolers definitely do not like psychophysics. So all the data at five years old that have been obtained are just based on adjusted platforms that we are using for psychophysics with adults. So and moves and we try all, the, all our best, but um, for instance, those DTI measurements in five-year-olds, that, that was about, that was a huge investment with three of my collaborators playing uh, games with, uh, with the kids and uh, in a, get them in a full storyline so they would be not a spaceship commander. In our storyline, the main storyline that was used, they would be a captain of a submarine because a scanner looks more as a submarine, of course. And so we have been able to do the ASS, ASR, that's less of an issue, but the DTI and the uh, resting state in, f in five years old of those whole group that, that I showed, there were only, it's only about 10% where it was not possible. But of course, with a lot of investment. Anyway, so up to now, tools for those psychophysics are adjusted for children. I just have one minute, I guess. Uh, what are the challenges? Increased duration of testing and attention span in those young children, because we want to get to higher precisions, you know? A lot of the data have been obtained, not only by us, but in most of the groups, have been obtained on group level. We want to go to the individual level. What is what do we need? Precision, that's what we need. So if we can get those kids, let's say instead of 10 minutes their attention, we can have them testing for two hours, there goes our precision. That would be the dream of them. <laughs> anyway. So, and then again, why not repeated testing? And there we think that the easy access to the test via internet might be really the, the thing to, to go for. Group effects to individual, clinical relevance, interleaving different tests. I'll give you a, an example. Automatic storage of test data, yeah, that, under investigation, so intelligent games. And then I would like you just to walk you through a few very simple slides of a huge project that we've started uh, by now two years, two years and a half ago. Together, it, it's a group, it, together about 10 people working on the nicest uh, uh, so really game builders, I mean, this is another world, game builders, that's, that's not really research, but to combine them, in, in it's really extremely nice, the results that we're we are getting. I mean, they are building intelligent games where the kid is taken on a journey, and really they want to test, uh, our data now say that we can test them already a factor of four longer than with our psychophysics that we have been doing up to now. So this is why we are doing it. So the game is Diesel X comes from diesel X, dyslexia. So this is focusing on... That's a 5 to 10 percent, the prevalence. And then if one of the parents is dyslexic, that's so that it goes up. So that's how we got to the those numbers. So these are a number of tests. So rise time, we know we can differentiate. Frequency modulation, we can, uh, in the visual field, coherent motion, we can do. Tony noise doesn't work. Phonological awareness, so we had to make a choice. Gappy noise doesn't, doesn't make a difference.
So a game has been developed, and so we focused on the, the first test was FM detection, rise time detection, and letter knowledge. Letter knowledge to get the, the phonological awareness, of course, and uh, speech, in, speech in noise. So these are a number of screenshots of those games that have been made. It's really wonderful. I mean, uh, you would like to play them yourselves. The nice things of these games is that we have uh, tested already that it's feasible to inter interleave those different testing procedures. So it's a whole storyline of, of uh, uh, a group of cats who will be uh, going to banks and, and rob uh, the banks and so, and then it's the, the little boy or girl with, uh, with the dog who will solve the whole problem. So it's a whole storyline and, 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 it, and it takes hours, it goes on for hours. So kids always want to go further and further and further. That's what we like, of course. And they do not know that we're getting staircases after staircases after staircases. Um, so, I come to my, the mixed salad. So let's conclude. Um, so I showed you a few examples of the relation of auditory processing with language and reading in young children. Um, I really think uh, that we have to focus, and I think that we, we can get there at least closer in, to on pro improved methods for testing young children, attention span, precision, game, use of modern media. Uh, we really have to go for the clinical relevance from group data and effects to, at group level, effects at group level to the individual level. Um, interesting, in, I showed you also that uh, we're still far away, but we're on the path of hoping one day to have a neurophysiological marker for early detection of dyslexia in children at family risk. These, uh, these methodologies that I've been addressing can equally well be applied for other populations, of course. I mean, this game, we picked out just those tests where we go for a dyslexia population, but you might apply that for other populations too. More practical and widespread hearing screening via the internet. And so this hopefully might facilitate more practical follow-up of speech perception, language, and reading. And then I would like to thank you. And these are my collaborators who worked with me on this, pro this project. Thank you.